Take a few moments and just thank him uh, together for who he is. Father, we want to thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your grace, Lord. Thank you for your mercy at work in our lives, Father. Thank you for who you are, Jesus, in our lives. We cannot ignore your goodness, Lord. We cannot uh, turn away from your mercy, Father. But, we, Lord, we cannot ignore the fact that you have just showered your grace and your mercy on our lives, Father God. We are here by your grace alone, Father. If you're standing here, Lord God, if, 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 we have, uh, if you're able to breathe today, if you're able to see today, Lord, every little bit of what we are able to do, Jesus, is because of your grace and your mercy, Father. And we want to acknowledge that, Father God. Today, Father, here in your presence, Lord, we're not too prideful to think that uh, it's all because of our strength, Father. But in your presence, Lord, there's only one thing that we can say, Jesus. It's by your mercy and your grace alone, Father. And because you have shown us such great, great mercy, and because you gave your life for us, because you opened a way for us to come close to you, Jesus, because you opened a way for us to be intimate with you and to be able to approach you and to call you Abba, Father, because you opened a way for us, Father God, we come confidently. God, we can come and we can live confidently, Jesus. Jesus, in your grace and your mercy, Lord. We thank you, Father, for who you are. Thank you for your great mercy in our lives, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. We give you the praise and the honor, Lord, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's just worship him together. Let's just give him the glory.
Father, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are God. And Father, we are part of that great multitude. That great multitude that, that has seen your goodness, that has seen your redemptive power, that has seen your work on the cross and how you gave your life for us and how you continually open yourself to us, Lord, and, and you just draw us nearer, Father. We are part of that huge crowd, Lord. And Father, when we look at you, we, and when we consider all that you are, there's nothing else that we can say apart from the fact that, there, Lord, there's nobody like you, Jesus. No one who can compare with you. No one who can compare with your goodness and your greatness. No one that can compare with your love. There's nothing in this world the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. And Jesus, we, we have been given the greatest treasure. And we thank you, Father, that you did not hold anything back. And Jesus, but you gave it all for us, Lord. You gave yourself, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says that that we don't need to store treasure here on earth where, you know, uh, where it can easily be destroyed, right? I mean, so many times we are holding on to the things around us, like, like the money that we have or the possessions we have, and we, we feel like, and we, we get so much of comfort and security out of all of that. But the truth about everything in this world is that every, every joy that the things of this world can, can bring is just, is just lives for, is just short-lived, right? It's just temporary. Right? But Jesus said, keep your treasure in heaven. Store your treasures in heaven where nothing can destroy it. Right? And just like we sang here today, for those of us who have received Jesus, we have the greatest treasure here on earth. And that's, that's what? Is that a great big check? Is that a lot of money in the account? Is that that big house? Is it? No, it isn't, right? The greatest treasure far beyond all of that is the presence of God in our lives. But he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Amen? That he is with us every single day. That's why, you know, the name of Jesus is Emmanuel. He's God with us, right? And that's what David himself said, even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will still not fear. I mean, what confidence is that, isn't it? I will still not fear because you are with me, right? Because everything in this world can easily be slipped away from our hands, can easily just go away. But there's one thing that remains through all of time. It's never going to end. Even if my breath here in this world is, is taken away, but this life that I have in Christ will never be taken away. It's an eternal treasure that we have in Christ. And that's why Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or how you're going to live, but remember that your heavenly Father knows what you need even before you ask Him. He's our heavenly Father today. Amen? Our God is our heavenly Father today. He's not a stranger. We are not strangers. We are not cut away from Him, but He calls us His children, and He is our heavenly Father. And that's why Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or how you're going to live, but your heavenly Father knows what you need. He said, look at the sparrows and see how, you know, God provides for them. And look at the grass in the field. Look at the flowers in the field. And, and they don't sow and they don't reap, but your heavenly Father, you're much more precious than all the birds of the air. Your heavenly Father knows what you need, and He'll provide for your needs. Amen? That's why he said, don't fear. Don't fear. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell them, don't fear. Come on, tell them, don't fear. Tell them, God will provide for your needs. Come on, tell them that. He knows your needs and he will provide for your needs. Come on, t t tell somebody today. I think somebody needs that comfort here today. That God will provide for your needs. Amen? Come on, tell them that. He is our heavenly father. And He will provide for our needs. Amen? Amen. Can we turn around and, and, and just, you know, meet some of the people around us? Just shake their hand, everybody. And, uh, you know, because we're not, we're not here as individuals, but we're here together as a church to worship. So, yeah, just, just, just meet each other. Say hello. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Amen? 
because he lives. Everybody say, because he lives. Because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Amen. Let's sing that song. confession because he lives I can face tomorrow because he holds my future who's holding our future Jesus. amen it's not the places that we work or the people that we work for that hold our future but who holds our future come on say it out loud Jesus, Jesus. amen amen Jesus holds our future come on just if you want to just uh, acknowledge that and just tell him, Jesus, you're the one who holds my future. My trust is in you alone. My trust is in you alone. You see, the psalmist said in, in Psalm 42, he says, Why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. 
put your hope in God. So Father, here we are today. Our, our trust is in you, Jesus. You're our Heavenly Father. You are our Lord. You are our provider. You are the light of our lives, Lord. nobody like you, Lord.
is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power. Our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are wiser than our thoughts. You alone are God, Father. You alone are God, awesome in power. We honor you here in this place. You are the great and all, almighty God, the awesome God, awesome in power. Jesus, you are far above all things, Lord. You don't need your... You don't need to take anyone's permission. Lord, you don't need anyone's advice. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are wiser than our thoughts. Oh. If our God is for us, can be against us. You know, the word says that there's no weapon that is fashioned against you that can prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you, you shall condemn. Maybe there are times in life where we feel like we are surrounded. We're surrounded by so many, so much of negativity and, and impossibilities and uncertainties. And during such times, it's important that we remember that if our God is for us, then who can be against us? That there is no weapon that is fashioned against me that can prosper. That my life is not determined by my circumstances, but my life is, is fashioned and is held by my God. My, it's you, my God, who, who leads me. source of wisdom you are the source of grace you are the source of life there is nobody like you Lord and Father this morning we just want to place our lives into your hands you know the word says that in view of God's mercy let us offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to Jesus, let us offer our lives as worship to Jesus. So I just want to encourage you this morning. In the presence of our God, let's just lift up our lives to Him. We surrender to your ways, Lord. It's not my ways, not my will but your ways alone.
lift up our hands, lift up our voices, and let's praise the Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. Jesus, there's nobody like you, God. We praise your holy name. In our lungs, so we pour out these dry bones. Praise you, God. It's your breath. and justice. Great is the Lord God Almighty. Great is the one who reigns in splendor, who is seated in the heavens above. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I would like to talk to you some lessons, talk to you about some lessons from the life of Job. From chapter 2 of Job till 30. Till we come to 38 or 37. This man waited for an answer from God. All these chapters. Finally, in chapter 38, everything changes for Job. God speaks. After that, uh, the, the historians and uh, scholars and theologians all made calculations of uh, Job's uh, troubled period. It was almost one year, the whole book of Job. And for this, when in chapter 38, God began to speak, it was for this job who was waiting, longing, crying, and panting. His prayer was, Lord, I won't mind. I don't care. 
if you rebuke me if you correct me if you chastise me i don't care but please speak job's greatest problem therefore was no more his afflictions but god silence Job was crying out, Job, just talk to me, God. Talk to me something. Please, Lord, be no longer silent. This was the cry of Job. and the bible says there then god answered job through a whirlwind out of the whirlwind and what a glorious visitation that was this long delay is finally worth it job must have thought at least this god is now speaking to me and when we are in the fire god doesn't expect all of our responses to be very perfect because we know i mean he knows how frail we are but the purpose of a fire or a furnace through which we are made to go through is to bring out the imperfection to the surface and that is why god lets us sometimes to go through fiery furnace because he has his purpose and his purpose is a very very important valid purpose because he wants to cleanse us and purify us in order to accomplish that he has to bring out on the surface all the imperfections and it is the fire that can bring the imperfections on the surface that is why fire is in there you don't go and buy a gold unless you know that that gold piece has gone through fire because you are concerned about the purity of the gold that you buy and that purity cannot come unless the gold go through the fire you know this gold when it goes through the fire there's one good thing that we learn You know where the eyes of this uh, goldsmith is when he put it in the fire His eye is always is that piece inside the fire and he will keep that piece inside the fire until he begins to see his own reflection in that gold and when he sees his reflection he removes it so my friends i want you to know that when god allows you or me to go through some fiery experience remember his eye will always be on us who is who are in the fire what is his purpose he wants to see his own reflection in us that is the purpose of fire and we also learn the purpose of the fire is to bring imperfection to the surface god is big enough to handle our fears and our anxieties and our our frustrations and our yearnings and our depressions and our anger and our self pity he knows and he sees all these in us and he knows that we are frail job was in perfect and 
and God had a plenty of corrections to bring to him. In chapters 38 to 41, God asked Job a series of questions. And in listening to these questions, God's questions to Job actually silenced Job's question. If you read the book of Job, we notice so many questions Job also asked. But all those questions were silenced by God's questions which Job could not answer even one single question. God asked about 65 questions. Job, do you know this? Or where were you when I did this? And after all this, what was God's final verdict on Job? The final verdict of God on Job was, he was a loyal, faithful, righteous servant. I desire nothing else, my friends. And in your Christian life, Always remember, there is one final verdict on each one of us. And that verdict is given by none other than the Lord God Almighty, the eternal God with whom we have to do our business. And his verdict will be the very final verdict. Before that, there will be no more verdict on you or on me. And live with this realization that there is a final verdict on me still waiting and that verdict will be pronounced on me on that day when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And when you live your Christian life here in this world, With, his, with that fear, I must live and I must conduct myself. What will be that verdict? God had a verdict on his own son, Jesus Christ, as a human being. God had a verdict on Moses. God had a verdict on his, uh, his servant, uh, Abraham. What will be God's verdict on me and on you? In the midst of these questions which have nothing to do with God, with Job's situation, or God's, I mean Job's problem. God spoke, but when he spoke, he never touched anything about Job's questions. Job is overwhelmed by hearing these questions that God asked him. He was overwhelmed with the revelation of God himself. What was needed for Job in his situation was to have a revelation of God himself. My friends, that is the ultimate purpose of God in allowing us to go through any kind of situation. He wants you to have a revelation of himself. And that's what Job received when God began to speak. And when we see God, we will have no more question whatsoever. The 
the disciples had so many questions after the crucifixion of Jesus even after the resurrection of Jesus they still had doubts and questions but in the John's in the, in the Matthew in the gospel according to St Matthew chapter 28 we read that suddenly Jesus appeared to these disciples and the first response of the disciples was what not as question Jesus where have you been what have happened to you why you allowed yourself to 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 suffer all this and what happened after your death now how are you here living none of these questions that was not in their mind at all when they saw jesus and the first response was they fell down and and worshiped him no other question all but the disciples knew here is the man on whom we placed all our hope he is still worthy of worship hallelujah and that is what happened to the disciples oh somebody please pray that i will get some money to buy a different type of mic <laughs> when god comes to job he revealed himself as what the creator he revealed himself as what as the creator and i want you to understand what god was working on in the life of job he needed to have a revelation of god himself which he got and then um job also needed to know who this god is he is the creator god and why that was very necessary for god the bible but bible particularly the new testament is very clear about what our attitude should be in the, in the, in the face of a delayed answer in the midst of our troubles and our pains and afflictions and our uncertainties and our hardship in first peter chapter 4 verse 19 apostle paul apostle peter writes this those of you want to look at it first peter chapter 4 verse 19 he writes peter write so then now remember he is writing to people who are going through terrible persecutions and opposition and he is writing to these people to encourage them to strengthen their faith and to remain faithful and to them he writes what they are supposed to what their attitude should be and what they should be doing he says so then those who suffer according to god's will remember i want you to take it's a, we read bible you know so many times but we don't take note of the particular words and the sentences used in conveying to us certain truths which we don't catch because we don't take note of it there is a suffering according to god's will uh, god's will when you suffer persecution it is a suffering according to god's will because jesus himself have promised that you will have tribulations and you will have persecution persecution is given along with the other promises so persecution also is a promise that's why i keep saying it doesn't matter who rules the center or state christians will always be persecuted and we also read a passage everyone who want to live a godly life will be persecuted and when you suffer persecution and when you suffer loss 
of your properties and your, 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 your position in your family, in your society, you are cast out and rejected. And when all these things happen, remember, you are suffering according to God's will. So you are not go out of God's will when you suffer for his name's sake. You are in the will of God. Remember that. And so those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. And continue to do good means to keep away from sin. And so when you go through these uncertainties, your afflictions and all that, is going to do something wonderfully good to your own personal life as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so what is the first thing? So here it is, Peter is almost giving a counsel to these people. And he gave a three kinds of counsel, what they should do. Very quickly, uh, because I have other four things to do. My time is almost over. In giving counsel to those who suffer and God seems to be silent, he gives a three-point three counsel. What is that? Number one, commit your soul to God. What does that mean? It means God is doing a work that he alone can do. So remember that. No one else can do. Pastor cannot do it for you. I cannot do anything in your life that can bring you into perfection. This is something only God can do and he has his way of doing it. And always remember, God has begun a work in you which only he can do. We must accept this and submit ourselves therefore to what God is doing. Instead of trying to speed it up, Sometimes we try to speed the process of God's work in our personal life by trying to get out, get out of it and all these sort of things. So Peter says, instead of um, uh, speeding up the process, one should commit his soul to God and trust in his ability to complete the work and perfect the work. And when he starts and perfects the work in you, you will be made a little more perfect. Amen. What is God's purpose? He wants to see you perfect. And that, that's, that is the first counsel. The second counsel is, while you wait, Continue doing good. In other words, apply yourself in seeking the face of Jesus Christ and thus keep yourself away from sin as you continue to seek the face of Christ. That should be our one desire. In the midst of all these trials I am going through, there is pain, there is affliction. Who can be a comfort to me? Only God. It is God who is touching me and causing this pain. At the same time, I must realize God alone can be my refuge as well. Where else do you go? Where else can you run to? There is no place. So the wisest thing for us to do is to run to God who is starting a work in you and you will find your strength in Him. So in all situations there is one thing that we can do. I remember there are times I could not sing. I could only lie down on my bed and roll on the bed. I did not know what was happening. I did not know what to do. I did not know where to go. And there are many occasions I can sing and get my comfort. There are so many old hymns that I keep singing. 
but there are other times when I couldn't even. So what do I do? The only place I can run to even at that time, though I know it is God who is causing me this pain, my only refuge is this God himself. And that's why Peter is encouraging them, while you are going through, keep seeking the face of God and continue to do good and increase in doing the good. And the thirdly, place your confidence in God and faith, and he is not only God, he is a very faithful creator. As we meditate upon God as our faithful creator, we begin to see many wonderful things which extinguish the fire of the trial. Like it happened to Job. Job still was suffering. But ultimately God began to speak, he is still suffering. And his suffering continued. You know how long? Until he prayed for his friends who were afflicted by God for telling all kinds of untruth. God was so angry with these friends of Job. And he said, you never spoke anything good. And so they were afflicted. And now they are sitting and suffering. So God told him, Job, you do one thing. He never touched Job. He never healed Job. He said, you go and pray for your friends. So these friends, God told these friends to go to Job and ask him to pray and he will pray for you. And so they came. I don't know what affliction was they going through, but it, was, it must have been terrible to be stricken by God. And Job saw their suffering and he had compassion on them and he prayed, God, have mercy on these friends of mine. <laughs> and God healed him. In that good thing Job did, he himself got healed completely. And so we also learn a few lessons. Let me mention four such wonderful truths about the Creator God. As Job saw and had no more questions. When he had a revelation of God, he had no more question to ask. There are four wonderful truths that Job learned. You know, when he had a revelation of God, this Job who appeared to be more wise than his friends and anyone else, Nobody could shut his mouth. Nobody could answer him anymore. And this man, when he had a revelation of God, he was ashamed, speechless, struck by the awesomeness of this God, the Creator. That is amazing. He said, I have nothing to say to you. I place my fingers over my lips. I won't open, I am ashamed. I spoke out of my ignorance. As he listened to these 65 questions that God asked him, as the creator, he was asking questions concerning the creation. And Job listened to his creation, these questions, and he was speechless. He appeared like a fool in his own eyes. And in the revelation of God, he also had a revelation of the wise, or the wisdom of this God. The all-knowing, all-wise, God and before his wisdom he was most foolish 
ignorant and to know nothing for I wish that today's Christian leaders will have a, such a revelation of God, at least as revealed in God's word. Let me quickly mention these four truths, then we will pray. Number one, he who fashioned Such an intricate and complex creation can surely oversee and bring to completion the complexities that trouble and afflict us in our present suffering. Remember that. For that, you'll have to be a student studying the creation and try to go deeper in your thinking. But my friends, when you understand the order and the design and the complexities of God's wonderful and marvelous creation, it is so amazing. God appears to be so awesome. So awesome. Beyond uh, we can bear his presence. His dwelling place is unapproachable light. Even the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Heaven is his throne and earth is the footstool. These expressions are used just to impress on us how great our God is and how greatly he is to be praised. And when we see the creator, what do we actually see? We see one who is big enough. I'm talking about, you, if you think that your little small backache and the toothache is so great, nobody suffer like I suffer. Oh, poor me. Always remember who your God is. Our God is big enough to handle any complexities, anything that you and I go through. Only then we see in this creator a quietness and a confidence. That is why David very often turned to the creations around him. He looked at the sky and he see the stars and the moon and the sun. And he declared the heavens, declared the glory of God and the firmament his handiwork. He is, in other words, the answer. That is what Job found out. All his questions are all answered in the person of this God whose revelation he received. <coughs> <coughs> all my difficulties, all my 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 pain and all my afflictions and all all the questions that. Uh, that rose up out of all this. Where do I find the answer? I find the answer. He is standing right in our midst this morning. I find the answer to all the complexities and the problems in Jesus. He is the answer. 
He does not simply read to you an answer of somebody. He is the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer to my pain. Jesus Christ is the answer to my doubts. Jesus Christ is the answer to my afflictions. Jesus Christ is the answer to my perplexities. Please, Jesus Christ is the answer to my depressions. Jesus Christ is the answer to, be, uh, to, the, my, to my unknown future. Jesus Christ is the answer to all other questions that may be there afflicting my own mind. He is the answer. Hallelujah. He is standing in our midst. That's what the, he's the creator. And secondly, he is a faithful creator, which means when God creates someone or something, he doesn't abandon his creation. He remains always faithful to his creation. He cares for his creations. He takes care of his creations. He is concerned about his creations. And he is there to manage all his creation. He remains always faithful. He faithfully oversees and guides and nourishes his creations. Why can't we believe it? this truth? He's our creator, God, who does not abandon his creation. He cares for you. If you believe that you are his creation. And especially when he created me second times and made me a new creation in Jesus Christ, his son, he is doubly responsible. Don't you think so? He is doubly responsible for you, my brother, my sister. And thirdly, Psalm number 139. I want you to stand with me along with your Bible. We are reading two passages. And then we are going to worship God. Psalm number 139. What a wonderful worshiper David was. Verse 16, 139 verse 16, I want all of us to read it together, shall we? Your eyes saw my unformed body, all the days ordained for me are written in your book before one of them came to be. This is our creator God. You know what it says here? It says when God creates us, he establishes us and he number our days. Hallelujah. That's what he did when he created you, brought you into this world. He has determined your days, number of days. And he established you in your life. So what? So in the time of delays, that is our subject. What do you do with the delayed answers? In the times of delays, I can abandon myself to my creator who has fashioned me with a purpose. Every bone, every nerve, every sinew, every air, he numbered and he knows. Hallelujah. Every number, he knows how many hair you have and each hair has been given a specific number. Like a prisoners are given a number. They don't know by their name, they know by their number. The hairs on your head 
have a specific number and not a single hair can fall without him knowing it so i can abandon myself into the everlasting arms of god and lastly what should be our attitude in the presence of our creator i'm reading psalm number 95 verses 6 and 7 and this too let us read it together 95 6 and 7 what should be our attitude when we go through all this not questioning god not doubting god and not doubting his love for you if you will only remember that you are created by god it is he who brought you here and he is not going to abandon you let us read it together shall we what is our attitude what should be here we go 1 2 come oh yeah yeah my brothers and sisters you did that If you are a faithful follower of Jesus Christ and you love him and you can trust him even when you do not know what is happening you can still trust him and you don't need the you need to know what he is going to do or how he is going to do all you need to do is to bow down and fall before him and worship him I wanted to sing a hymn but there is no time let us lift up our hands all kirabashanandariana all hail the power of jesus name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him lord of all hallelujah shall we lift up our voices as we... he is worthy my brother no matter what pain you go through he is still worthy to be praised No matter what afflictions you are going through he is still worthy to be praised no matter how we how weak you are he is still worthy to be praised and worshiped you give him the glory and honor and praise hallelujah hallelujah shall we together just praise god for one minute before you leave this place lifting up of your voice unto god lord here i stand i can only worship you I can only thank you I can only uh, only exalt your name for you are great like job lord we humble ourselves we know that we don't know and neither can we do anything no one else can do what only you can do lord in order to accomplish your purpose you may do it and it may cause us some pain and yet that pain is necessary so that you are my face will become reflections of you oh god thank you father god i pray that every one of these children of yours from the youngest to the oldest shall experience this wonderful peace and wonderful presence of our creator god who never abandons his creation we give you glory forgive us oh god our little knowledge forgive us oh god our little understanding which causes us to be so arrogant at times but we admit that we are nothing what we are today only by your grace thank you thank you we give you the glory in jesus name amen Amen.